Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Saturday morning live group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic. How are you all doing this morning? To start out with, why we want to extend a very special welcome to anybody who's never been here before. And we hope you get something out of it and enjoy it and uh, find it helpful to your program. And uh, if any of you are brand new to AA, if you are just arriving in this uh, great fellowship known as Alcoholics Anonymous by everybody here wants to extend a very special welcome. Um, we all know exactly how it feels to first arrive in AA with great mixed emotions. I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. It was somebody else's idea. Um, I think I better get out of here now. These people are too fanatical. All, whatever all those feelings are, and uh, all we can suggest is that you go against your better judgment and stay. That's uh, because if I had relied on my own judgment, I never would have stayed here, and I had a good sponsor who kept me here, and then I was able to see what was going on, to experience what was going on, and it turned out to be, like it is for just about every other alcoholic, the biggest turning point in my life, and... Um, so we suggest that if you are new, just stick around, keep going to these meetings, and be the judge of what's happening in your life. Uh, it may not look like it's going to work, but there's tremendous, wonderful things in store for anybody who will stick around in this great organization known as Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, it's customary to start our meetings with the preamble, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who have shared their experience, strength, and hope with each other, that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We're self-supporting to our own contribution. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy. Neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And before I get to the sixth step, uh, let me just make some general observations. And we do this every week because every week we have new people that are here. And we want to make some general comments about the steps to put them in perspective so that when we get zeroing in on this sixth step, why it may make a little more sense to those of you that may be new. But when we talk about Alcoholics Anonymous and people say, what is Alcoholics Anonymous? The 12 steps, that's it. That is what Alcoholics Anonymous is. This is uh, what individual members of Alcoholics Anonymous are doing in order to stay sober and happy. And notice that I said in order to stay sober and happy. I didn't say in order to stay sober. I said in order to stay sober and happy. Those two things really have to go together. It is almost impossible to stay sober and miserable for any extended period of time. That's what going on the wagon is, and all of us try to do that. Okay, I'm not going to drink. <clears throat> and then you walk around, people say, what are you doing? Say, I'm not drinking. And you could just see the neck muscles, and depending on what your pain threshold is, sometimes people can stay like that for months, maybe even years. But that is not something to shoot for. I mean, just that raw, I stayed sober in jail. I stayed no, sober in the nut ward. It was real easy. There was no alcohol available, but I wasn't happy, and I could hardly wait to get out. So what we want, and what the program is designed to give us, is freedom from alcohol. Freedom from the tormenting thought of taking a drink. Total freedom so that on a daily basis, you don't even deal with not drinking. Don't even deal. It doesn't even come up to be dealt with. It just isn't on the agenda to worry about. And I'm sure if you're new, that sounds impossible that you could go through a day and not think about a drink. Well, that's what sobriety is. And that is what the uh, AA solution looks like. It doesn't figure the problem out. It removes it. And that's because this is a spiritual program. And spiritual solutions are entirely different from the ones that we've been used to, where we figure things out and they, they follow some logical thing, and that's how I stay sober. Here we come, and um, generally, as a last resort, 
Uh, people don't generally come to AA on a roll because their lives are going so good. They want to improve it. Uh, more than likely, there's been some problems and some pressure, and there's something that needs to be resolved, and so we end up at a meeting, and generally against our own better judgment. And I remember that feeling of being here, oh, this is the end of the world. But I found out that everyone in the room had gone through that same thing, and they were all talking about the 12 steps. So the 12 steps are what I like to call a game plan for living to replace the plan that you're currently using. And the reason for replacing the plan, as it was explained to me, is because your current plan is getting lousy results. And if you're new to here and you're filled with remorse or guilt and anger and you feel that your life is going in the wrong direction, that you're going down, it may be successful from the outside. Somebody may look at your life and say, look at this gal or look at this guy, big shot in the government, driving a new car, blah, 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 blah. But that's not what we're trying to look at. We're trying to look at how is it going inside? How does it feel when you look in the mirror? How are your relationships with other people going? How are you eagerly looking forward to every day? Are you, you know, all of those things. And when you get honest with yourself, you find you're not happy at all. There's, there's something fundamentally flawed with the whole plan, with your whole life. And alcoholism and this disease has brought us here. And we're going to find out that for us, for us alcoholics, this path known as the 12 steps is going to make dramatic changes in looking at the world from the inside out. And so, this 12 steps are a plan for living. And it's different from other plans. Let me make a few observations about that. The first thing that I'll say about these 12 steps, and most anybody who is new has already seen them. They've picked up a where and when, or they've picked up some A literature, and they've scanned these 12 steps and looked at them. And if you are a typical new person, having looked at those 12 steps, this is what you will see. You will see something that in your judgment has no relevance to your life and makes no sense whatsoever. Looks good in the abstract. It's uh, certainly noble, has a lot of nice qualities to it, but it does not direct, does not zero in on the problems in your life as you see them. So that's step one. And when you look at spiritual solutions, they don't look like they should work. AA doesn't look like it should work. I, I, mean, I talk about this all the time with those new people here. AA does not look like it should work. It does not make sense. Um, I know if you're new, maybe you've been here about three or four months and you're down in, at work and somebody comes up and says, Mary, um, you look wonderful. Are you on a diet or something? Because people start seeing us when we come in here and we get sober and there's some changes going on. Are you on a diet? No, 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 I'm not. So they keep harassing you and if they're close enough, maybe you get them aside. You, Come on, okay, I'll, I'll tell you. Now, don't tell anybody else. I'm in AA. And they go, no kidding. Well, do they have a health program in there? I mean, what? There's no immediate connection. But why do you look better? Because you're going, oh, it's this, this wonderful new way of life. Well, what is it exactly? Well, mostly it's the meetings. I see you go to meetings, and as a result of that, you look like, the, yeah, yeah, I do. Well, what do you do with the meetings? Oh, it's great. You want me to tell you? Well, my home group, for example, we meet on Wednesday night. It's at what we call a discussion meeting. And it's at 8.30, and it's down in the basement of a church, and there's been about 25 of us are there routinely. And we all sit around the table. We get some coffee, and we sit there. And then one of us is the leader. And the leader thinks up a topic, you know, like resentment. And then... They say something about resentment, and then each person gets to say something about resentment. And then we all hold hands and say the Lord's Prayer, and we go home. <laughs> and uh, you want to come? You know. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
So that certainly doesn't look like it would do anything. Am I right or not? I mean, I still don't understand why when I walk in there, there's 25 people, and some jerk is leading on with and I listen to And about 45 minutes into that, I start feeling fine. I just start. So it has to be experienced. So spiritual solutions have to be experienced. If you went to the meeting, then you would experience it. And you would go, yeah, this is good. This is. I can feel what's happening. So this, this, this is why these 12 steps, anything that we try spiritually, six step in particular, when we get to that, just a look at that. Like, Give me a break. Get that out of here. That just isn't what we're going to get into my life. So why are all these people doing this if it doesn't look like it should work. Well, we have an advantage. We have two things going for us. One, we have the power of attraction in Alcoholics Anonymous. It is the program of attraction rather than promotion. So we don't try to explain it. We just try to show you the results. And that's really what AA meetings are. Speakers get up at speakers meeting. Hello, my name is Helen. I've been sober for four years. I used to do blah, 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 and now I'm like this. And you get to look at someone who is experiencing these 12 steps, and you see the results that you like. You see someone who is sort of glowing from the inside out, someone who has friends, someone who seems to be moving into the mainstream of the world, and you are attracted to that person. And what you are attracted to is the 12 steps. You are attracted to what you are seeing in this person. So that's one thing that we have going for us in AA. We have this attraction to try something that we may not believe in. My friend Clancy on the West Coast, that's exactly how he describes the steps. They are a series of actions which we take which we don't believe in ahead of time. Afterwards, that when all these things happen, then you go, hey, this stuff works. Uh, but the second thing, and maybe even more powerful than this attraction that we have working for us, is booze. Booze is working for us. Booze is circling every AA meeting. I guess I have to tell that for new people. A lot of times they don't know that. But around every AA meeting in the grass are literally tens of thousands of half pints of vodka. And they stay down below the level of the grass, and they just circle. And you can't really see them out there, but they just circle. And they just wait for someone to come out and say, the hell with AA, I'm out of here. And as soon as they hear that, one of them jumps up and just goes, hi. And you look, and you go, god damn, full half pint of vodka. Here, must be God's will. <laughs> <coughs> and we go back to drinking. And drinking beats the crap out of us. It beats us down until we want relief from it. And then we are willing to do anything in order to get relief from what life is giving to us. And we go, anything? Yes, anything. I'll stand on my head in the corner. I'll drive 20 miles. to go. I know, but would you do the steps? Hmm, I don't know about that. That's going too far. But the, So we don't do them. And we're back out drinking, and alcohol beats up on us again. And it's almost like we have the power of attraction, and then we have alcohol grabbing our elbow behind and lifting it. You want to try them yet? No. no. Not ah. You want to try them yet? And there we're caught. And if you're an alcoholic, you ain't getting out of that. There's no way to get out of that catch-22 situation, because there's no middle ground. You are never going to learn how to drink successfully. And on your own, you're not going to be able to not drink happily. And so you're caught. And so eventually, we come in here and go, all right, what's this 12-step crap? And we get a sponsor, and we start down this road. So I make these general observations because most of us have these feelings and reactions when we look at this particular program. So having gotten that all out of the way, the fact that you're going to see all the results of this, which can help overcome your intellectual analysis of the 12 steps. And just forget that, that they will never make any sense. The reason we have meetings, and we've been here, some of us, for 25 or 30 years, is to come back and be reminded that this is the solution. Because when you go out into the day, away from the uh, spiritual environment of 
the meetings, then circumstances start coming, and the next thing your brain is telling you, ah, here's a terrible set of circumstances that the steps don't apply to. I'm going to have to deal with this myself. And then we get in the middle of it and get all screwed up and thrown off balance, and we go to a meeting and, don't forget, don't drink, pray, work the steps, call your son. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And we're reminded to go back to this solution, which doesn't look like it should work. Then we do it, and then we find the tremendous results of doing it, and then we once again believe and are on track again. So it's always going to be like that. Now, the doorway into all of these steps, and we always talk about the first step, and then we'll jump right to the sixth, uh, is the first step where it says we're powerless over alcohol. And the reason that's the doorway is because of the word powerless. Powerless is probably the doorway into all spiritual programs. Generally, people decide to explore spiritual, spirituality or religion or whatever you want to call it when they're having a problem. You know what I mean? Life has gotten all of a sudden, you know, I better go get some help here. It seems to be overpowered by something. And no one gets more overpowered by anything than alcoholics. We absolutely get overpowered by alcohol, and we end up saying, I am powerless over alcohol, and I'm willing to admit that. And as soon as we admit that, what we have admitted without realizing it is we have said, I'm in a situation that unless there is some power source to take care of powerlessness, I'm going to end up dying drinking. That's a powerless over alcohol. It's saying, on my own, I will never be able to do anything about this situation, and therefore it will continue to worsen until I end up like alcoholics who keep on drinking end up, which is bad. Very bad endings. No happy endings. For alcoholics who drink all the way till they die, it's just a terrible, terrible thing. And we, in the beginning, it's never going to happen to us, but then after some years go by, we start seeing that we're on an elevator that's going all the way to the bottom, and we got to get off of here. And that's what being powerless over alcohol is. What it says is, <clears throat> unless there's a higher power, I'm going all the way to the bottom. That's what powerless is. It does not say, I'm ignorant about alcoholism. Then you could learn your way out of your problem. You could study, 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 become the world's expert, have a Ph.D. in alcoholism. But if you were an alcoholic, sometimes when people came to your lectures on alcoholism, they'd have to wait for you to sober up and get up off the ground where you were passed out. And now, oh, I'm okay now. Now I'll give my lecture on, and you would know everything there is. So knowledge will not help us in this if the situation is that we're powerless. So the 12 steps are simply a plan, and it's an old plan. It's been around forever. These principles have been borrowed from philosophies, from religions, from uh, the early experience of AA itself, but there's nothing really new in any of the steps. They are very practical, time-tested means of getting in touch with a power that will add tremendously to everyone's life. Now, the other thing I want to say about this power, because now we've talked about powerlessness and we're shifting gears and saying the only answer to powerlessness is to find a higher power. And when we do that, a lot of people go, oh, now here comes the religious part, and I'm out of here. And AA is truly unique in this uh, respect, in that it is just a spiritual program. And a spiritual program simply shows us means for us to use to get in touch with a, a higher power. And once that happens, it'll be up to us to explain what it is. Uh, you can call it the, your sponsor. You can call it the AA program. You can call it whatever you want. But the fact remains, you need it. So AA does not try to prove the existence of God. Rather, we are experts at convincing alcoholics of the need for God. That's where we come in, and we zero in and show what powerlessness is when you are confronted with uh, an alcohol problem. Let's say that you were a person who had uh, picked up a book on parachutes and saw how they were packed, and you saw the flaws in, you know, the, a guy could fold this the wrong way, you know, those damn things, there's a chance that they won't open a lot of the time. 
And so I take the position right now that I don't believe in parachutes. And I'm never going to go up in a plane. I'm never going to jump out. And I'm never going to do that. That's a wonderful position to take while you're standing on the ground. But let's suppose that someone kidnapped you, took you up in an airplane, strapped a parachute on, and threw you out and said, that non-believer will go to his death because he refuses to believe in parachutes. What we're saying is, that would be a wonderful time to change your mind. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And just say, what the hell? <clears throat> so I look bad. Right? Because that's why we don't want to pull the ripcord. What if it opens? On the one hand, it'll save my life, but I'll also look bad. Maybe I won't pull it, and I'll keep my pride and splash. <laughs> and then people will write ballads about me. There's a guy that stuck to his convictions. There's a guy. <laughs> right? And that's what we do as alcoholics. We're not going to change our mind and ask for help. I'm going down. I'm in jail, but I got here. That's, that's why my theme song, if I was drinking, would be, I did it my way. I love that sound. I did it my way. It appeals to my ego. Now I'm coming in here, and guess what you're going to say? Oh, no, don't do that. Turn over all of that to a higher power. Well, what if it all works out wonderful? Who gets the credit? The higher power. I'd rather have it work out crappy and have me get the credit. You know what I'm talking about? That's, that's the problem with the ego versus spirituality. And so, same thing with a higher power. If you're a hopeless alcoholic, you're in the elevator. It's not going to crash unless you change your mind about a higher power. And we struggle with that, and that's what our second step is, changing our mind about a higher power, coming to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity, then making a decision to turn our will and our lives over to this power. In other words, this has to be our top priority because we have this alcohol problem that's here 24 hours a day waiting to get us. So all we need is to have a power that we have access to, that just keeps this alcohol problem over here. And then we just go on about our business. That's what the spiritual solution looks like. The alcohol problem is removed on a daily basis, contingent on our spiritual condition, and we are free then to go about a peaceful life. Now, what happens is, now we've made this decision, okay, I'm going to find out about a higher power. How do you do that? And many of us think we have to go on a journey to Tibet or some study some form of religion, which is fine. A lot of us do that. Um, but the program says, no, all that's required is to remove the blockages between you and this higher power. The fundamental idea of a higher power has been inside of you all your life, just like the fundamental idea of a friend. The problem is we have self-centered, instinctual character instinctual driven character defects that block us from this higher power coming in. And as we drink more and more and we retreat into self-centeredness, we block out lines of communication with other people. I and mean, it's a very um, trapping disease that just brings us more into ourselves and there's less and less that we share. And the more we block out the love of our family and communications with other people, the more isolated we become, the more we claim that none of this exists. I can remember getting to the point where someone said, isn't it wonderful all the love in the world? And I'm going, there is no love in the world. And then he's getting in here. I had built a way so that none of it could get in here. And so from my perspective, it was a very mean world that I lived in, but it, well, that wasn't true. But I, that's the way I had established it by blocking out all these wonderful things, including a higher power. So if you had asked me, have you ever seen any evidence of God? I would have said no. And if I had a lie detector on here, it would have said I'm telling the truth. I had never said I had blocked this out. There was no flow. I had no awareness. Because alcohol was my higher power. And I totally relied on that. And I had no evidence of any higher power anywhere. And so it took uh, these steps and this program for people to show me how to tear down this prison that I had built that blocked out all these wonderful things. 
And if you want the sun to shine on, I have to get all the things that are blocking it so that it can shine on me. And that's exactly what the rest of the program is. We start in the fourth step by inventory. We had a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. What are all these things that are blocking out these things that other people are talking about? I see, you know, my sponsor is serene. I see that he has serenity. How do you get serenity? You get serenity by b- removing all the things that are blocking serenity. That it's, the spiritual solutions are different. You don't go get anything. As a matter of fact, we end up talking in step six about character building, which is really what spirituality is all about. And character building is done by tearing down. Isn't that funny? You build by tearing down. You get rid of things, and what remains is what we're after. So in order to go anywhere, to grow, you get rid of things. It's kind of like riding in a balloon. If you want a better view, you throw stuff overboard. And the more you get rid of certain things, ballast, baggage, whatever you want to call it, then you rise higher and you have a better view. And this is exactly what our steps are talking about. Made a searching, fearless, moral inventory of ourselves. And then, in step five, admitted to God, to another human being, to ourselves, the exact nature. So last week we were talking about, we made a list of all these character defects, whatever you want to call them, many of them secrets that we were never going to share with anybody. And in step five, we actually went and talked to another human being about our exact nature for the first time and learned that it put things in perspective. It was like 3D photographs, aerial photos. You need two of them in order to see the third dimension. And we need another human being in order to understand the truth about ourselves. And then we come to the heavy-duty steps. Six and seven are the heavy-duty steps in the AA program. And I think that when Bill wrote the big book, I don't think he realized the impact of these two steps and when he came back, I mean the real impact, and when he came back in the 12 and 12, you know, about 12 or 13 years later, why he started out the sixth step by saying, this is the step that separates the men from the boy. And uh, in the uh, big book, it was about two or three sentences about, let's just get willing. So the sixth step says, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Very innocuous looking step when you think about it. Well, I figured out all the things that are blocking me and kind of messing my life up about me. And I'm now I'm entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. That's fairly simple. We just move on from there. It's the analogy that I can think of is the congressional budget. Everybody agrees, balance that mother. Let's balance it. We're so far in debt, it's absolutely crazy. Everybody agrees, hey, we're going to balance it. Okay. Cut you, 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 you. And then we got specific. And we went, whoa, 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 whoa. It was in the specifics that the resistance began. And that's exactly what happens when we say, you know, I do want to become a better person. I want to become a better person. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And so our our brain tells us that this step says, now listen to what it really says. It says we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And our brain tells us that what this step says is, I ought to really try to become a better person. And better person as defined by me. (laughs) Right? I mean, Bill overstated it when he wrote, we're entirely ready to have God remove all those defects. I mean, that's clearly an overstatement. And um, besides, I don't see any saints in this room. I don't see anybody who's ever had all their character defects removed. So what it really means is just try to do the best you can. That's kind of what it says. But it doesn't say that. It said we're entirely ready to have God remove all the defects of character. And go, whoa. So first... Whenever Bill writes in, in our literature, you find that he'll throw something out, and then the next thing he'll throw is your <laughs> reason for not doing it. And Because he was an alcoholic, too. He knows that we're going to fight this every step of the way. So the first thing that he thinks we might raise is, whoa, wait a minute. You're saying, if I get ready to have God remove a character defect, it's gone? Is that what you're trying to suggest to me? And the step says, yes, that's exactly what we're trying to suggest. Well, has that ever happened? Yes, it has. 
Happens all the time. If I look in this room, there's 420 people here this morning. If they've been around AA for a while, there's 420 people who've had exactly this happen. You know where it happened? With our drinking. We became entirely ready to have this removed from our lives. That's what happened to us when we got here. And by God, it got removed. There are, there are just millions of people who will stand up and say, alcohol used to torment me. It was the biggest problem I ever had. It's not even on my agenda today. I don't even think about alcohol. I have total freedom from it. So the, here is, and Bill writes this, this is the dilemma of being a human being, is right in this little part right here. Having had absolute proof of this step, why don't we do it on all the rest of the character defects? Why don't we simply just go, hey, I'm going to totally get rid of pride and greed and lust and envy and gluttony and sloth, and I'm going to do it just like I got rid of drinking. And nobody does. Nobody does. So he writes in the 12 and 12, this is the riddle of our existence, and maybe only God knows the answer to this. But part of it is, the rest of the character defects are not as life-threatening as alcohol was. Alcohol was almost a do-or-die type of thing, unless I became entirely ready to, and totally get rid of that. Uh, I was going to die. And so I was able, even my instincts were even able to go along with that. But on the rest of them, it turns out that we start qualifying. And this is what this step is, really an epic step. And it's, it shows us the full implications of a spiritual journey, and it's frightening and exciting at the same time. And I always like to tell the story of the chicken and the pig. You've been, people have been coming here for a while. Oh, no, step six, chicken and the pig. Little boy with a toothache. <laughs> but the chicken and the pig are standing out in the lawn outside the farmer's house. The farmer's eating breakfast of ham and eggs. And the chicken said, isn't it wonderful how we serve our master? And the pig said, hey, for you it's a contribution. For me it's total commitment. <laughs> And so, the difference between the men and the boys, the girls and the women, is the difference between the chicken and the pig. Um, when it comes to, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Bill suggests that one of the reasons we resist this is that we like our character defects. We like them. They give us pleasure. I mean, I think that gossiping is just terrible, but it's fun. You know what I mean? And so I really want to stop doing it. How many times have you said, I'm not going to do that anymore because it really, it's not fair. I don't even know if what I'm saying is true. It really could be hurting somebody. Else. Hey, have you heard about Fred? <laughs> Damn, there I did it again. Well, everybody's doing it. You know what I mean? So, but I'm going to get better. Maybe you do. You end up getting rid of most of that, and you only repeat some story about every couple of years because it's just unbelievable, and you, and you had to. But for most of the time, you did pretty good on that. And then, but then, what about greed? What about envy? How can I stop? I look around. People have got better deals than I do. I can't. It's not my fault. They're just there. Can't help observing it. Can't help thinking that way. What about lust? I remember somebody said, why don't you... Wouldn't you like to have lust removed? And he said, yes. It really does. Not all of it. Not all of it. I mean, wait a minute. What would it be like to have lust removed? No, I get these mental images of a eunuch or a, a celibate or, or I don't know what all those things are, but they sound frightening to me. So maybe it, like 90% of lust gone and leave me ten just so I know I'm a human being. Don't you think that would be good? And what about sloth? I mean, you know, being lazy. Um, I'm not really lazy. I just would like to inherit a million dollars so that I could sit in Florida in the sun and play golf every day. But that's sort of because I like exercise. I would explain retirement in terms that it wouldn't be perceived as 
I've decided to stop growing as a human being, and I just want to wall around and make myself feel better. But I, that's not really what I mean. And so I just rationalize each one of these things, and I have a qualifier on it. You know, yes, I want to not be so greedy as to do this. And so Bill said, we end up giving up the extremes. I don't want to be so angry I kill anybody, but I don't want to totally get rid of anger. Because anger is fun. So I like being angry sometimes. I'm angry at causes because my causes are superior to your causes. And I like to have this indignation, this righteous indignation. You know, if I got rid of that, hell, I'd be nobody. And so each one of these things, it's a funny thing, we end up making some qualifier, and Bill ends up saying in here, we end up settling for as much perfection as will get us by. That's sort of our approach to step six. I'm here, I'd like to move to here. And the step says, how about trying for there? And you go, no, no, I don't want to do that. I liked it, and I remember it, it sort of, the realization starts sinking in. You start going, now wait a minute. When I joined this outfit, I joined it to stop drinking. And then after I was here for a while, my sponsor said, well, maybe you ought to stop embezzling, too. (laughs) And then he, you know, he made a case for that that could be a threat to my sobriety. And then, all right, right, okay, so I'm I'm not going to drink and I'm not going to embezzle. And then he goes, all right, and he says, if you really want to keep your marriage together, you're going to have to stop those affairs. Jesus, what the hell is this goddamn organization? You know this? And so then, okay, all right. Like, now I've made these huge sacrifices. And then the next thing, well, what about getting rid of that? What about getting rid of that? What about getting rid of the next thing? I start seeing the full implications of this thing, and it's a two-step program. Don't drink and change everything there is about you. That's there. That's the whole program, you know. And, it, and suddenly the implications of step six come roaring in. If I could just do this, I'd be Mother Teresa. Man, I mean, I admire Mother Teresa. I don't think she's having any fun. I mean, where, where's the Mercedes? Yeah, where's the nightclubs and... Is this what you're trying to do? Are you trying to suggest that, whoa, instead, whoa, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm out of here. I don't want anything to do. This is too much. And so that is the normal reaction. Our instincts and our desires are threatened by some absurd position that we have here. And so there's tremendous resistance to step six. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. The resistance to this can be understood, I think, with the story that we generally wrap this step up with, the little boy with the toothache. Been here for years. You've heard this for years, but I love this story. Um, and the story is the little boy, he's probably in about fourth grade, he's a great baseball player. And the coach, the big game's tomorrow. And the coach says, now, Johnny, I want you to get eight hours sleep tonight. It's absolutely essential you get eight hours sleep tonight. So okay. So he goes to bed, right? Boom. So he's going to get eight hours sleep. Sleeps about four hours, and he wakes up because he's got the beginning of a little toothache. And the toothache just goes twinge. You know how that does? Oh, damn, get that little toothache. And he says, oh, call my mother, get two aspirin. She comes in, take the aspirin, boom, I'm right back to sleep. That's what I should do. But he doesn't do it. Instead of doing that, he waits to see if it's going to go away by itself. And he waits a little while and goes, boom, there's another one, a little bit stronger. And he goes, I'll call my, no, I think I'll wait and see if it'll go away by itself. And he plays this let's wait and see game for two and a half hours until it won't go away. And then he calls his mother, gets the aspirin, goes back to sleep, wakes up the next day, only got five hours sleep, doesn't do too well in baseball. And, you know, it's just one of those things that we zero in on the two and a half hours. What the hell's going on in this kid's mind that he would delay two and a half hours and then go get the aspirin and screw everything? Why didn't he just call his mother and get him? The answer is, once we get inside this little kid's head, yes, he knows his mother will bring the two aspirin in. And immediately, with great love, give him the two aspirin, he'll go right back to sleep. But he knows that she won't stop there. The next day, while he's at the ball game, she'll make a dental appointment. And then he'll go into the dentist. And the dentist will say, what's the matter? And he says, I got this little tooth thing. Oh, yeah, we can fix that. Listen, while you're here, we're going to look at every tooth in your mouth. Bring in the dental assistant. Take some x-rays. Doom, 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 check. Oh, here's another one. Boom, done. Here's another one. And you don't get out of there till you have perfect teeth. 
He didn't want perfect teeth. He wanted two aspirin. That's all he wanted. That's all he wanted. I didn't want to try all these steps and become entirely ready. I just wanted to not drink. You see, my not drinking was my two aspirin. But the only help, the only provider of not drinking is a higher power. The only help that's available is perfect help. So when I ask for help, I'm going to get perfect help. And I go, I don't know if I want perfect help. You know what I mean? See, we settle. I just want, that's our human side. And so the struggle begins where we start seeing that maybe we have not put in perspective what our life is all about. Maybe we thought getting promoted and being president of the company was our top objective. And we come in here and we're forced to face something that says, maybe my real purpose on being on this planet is to engage in this struggle right here, where I try to move from some limited objective of improving myself as a spiritual being in order to get ahead in the world. Hell of a motive for moving ahead spiritually. Better to have an honest reputation than to actually be honest. Then you couldn't rip off anybody who thought you were honest. Ha <laughs> ha you know, so And so it we see now why this is an epic step. It's gonna focus for us, each one of us as individuals the clash between our human side and the spiritual side. And all we came here to do was to not drink, but the only way to have the gift of sobriety is to engage to the best of our ability in this struggle, in this struggle to go against our instinctual drives and try to move ahead and become a better person. And so step six is simply an attitude. We're never going to get there, but we're never going to stop trying. That's what step six is saying. There's a thing. I'll close with this. I know we ran a little over. Uh, I remember a little 24-hour day book thing. And the prayer in the 24-hour day book was, I pray that I may be never satisfied with my spiritual condition, which is almost could be paraphrased. Dear God, please always keep me frustrated. You see what I'm saying? In other words, I will always sense that I've got to keep on moving. And, and we start talking about that in step seven next week. So six starts out with this rather innocuous little thing, and when we really get into it and take a look at it, we find out that the journey that we're on in here is perhaps the most important journey that you will ever be on in your life. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And it's, this is what First Things First is, is trying to change and put the spiritual progress ahead of everything else. Now, as a human being, I may have the option of whether I do that or not. As an alcoholic, I don't have the option. And I've always considered that my edge. Is <laughs> that as an alcoholic, I have to do these things that produce all these wonderful things in my life. Whereas if I had the choice, I wouldn't be doing it at all. We're at the end of the time. We've got a great way to wrap this up with the Lord's Prayer for anybody who would care to join in. Hi. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Keep coming back. It works if you work it.